these guys from uh, from Europe, the West, the US, trying to teach Southeast Asians about their relationship with China is the funniest thing there is. I, I they really can't see themselves. Okay, people in this region have historical memory. They have a memory of. 1,500 years at least, I mean, we're talking about cultural and historical memory of interaction with China. The, I think the one that is pushed, the narrative that is pushed, uh, the, sort of the debt trap one is absolutely dead in the water. People know about debt trap here, post-IMF, for example. What happened to Indonesia in, in, in after the 1997 crisis? It wasn't China that did this. And actually, China played a very constructive role in uh, in refusing to devalue, in holding off devaluation of the yuan uh, during the Asian financial crisis and kind of holding the, the, the breach. Hello, everybody. This is Pascal from Neutrality Studies. And today I've got not one, but two great thinkers with me. And for the first time ever on this channel, my guests are not just brilliant, but they're also married to each other. I'm talking to John Peng and Naoko Kumada. John is a senior research fellow at the Perak Academy, a think tank in Malaysia. He has served in policy and thought leadership in government, business and academia, with a focus on the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, that is ASEAN in short, uh, he was also the founding CEO of the ASEAN Research Institute and of the Council of Southeast Asian Business Leaders, con uh, consulting firms and decision makers in government and business. He's interested in the reframing of the discourse of international relations, especially as it applies to China and Southeast Asia toward the emerging multipolar world order. And as you probably know, he is together with me in this new multipolar peace alliance that we formed just a couple of weeks ago. And then I also got Naoko, who is a lecturer in Zhejiang University's School of International Studies. She's a social anthropologist and Myanmar specialist, studying the interaction of politics, religion, and uh, legal order in East Asia. She received her PhD in social anthropology from the University of Cambridge and also holds, holds an LLM in US law from Santa Clara University. She's currently exploring how the rise of China and changes in global order play out against Southeast Asian regionalism and constitutional revisionism in Japan. So a lot of Asia, Asia to discuss today. Welcome to both of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thrilled to be here, Pascal. I'm a huge well, fan of your channel. Thank you very much. I'm very glad Likewise. to have you here. Bo both Likewise, of I'm also a fan of your channel. And thank you so much for having, having me here. Thank you both. And, you know, um, I, I'm always happy to hear that that people watch the, these talks and that we can then have more discussions like this one, because we said we should sit together uh, and, and explore the link between um, the, the Western order that we have at the moment and Southeast Asia and then also Japan. So uh, let's do this a little bit like Peng, um, sorry, Peng, uh, John, I want to say, um, John, you are a, a, a from Malaysia, and you've worked with Malaysian um, uh, uh, political like decision makers, and in the, the whole process, in the ASEAN process for 15 years. Um, what do you think it is that we are not considering about ASEAN, Southeast Asia in general, when it comes to the way that that region interacts with e each other and with the outside world? I think um, at least, Two things. One, um, ASEAN's uh, core position about their relationship with one another and about regional order is already a form of multipolar thinking. ASEAN is already a kind of, exper not just an experiment, but a project in, in multipolar uh, world order. So it begins with uh, it's and it's very much tied to the uh, uh, the independence of these of, of of this region. So so one thing to know about this region is that almost all of it has been colonized. Even the one exception, Thailand, uh, only survived by 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 having to play the the powers off against each other and was very substantially had its sovereignty uh, compromised. So no one wants to go back to that. 
1955, they had the first Bandung conference at which they asserted principles uh, for of coexistence. Uh, recently, these principles were uh, very similar. Principles were ce were celebrated in 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 Beijing, right? The anniversary of these principles. Um, that is the five principles of coexistence. But as, uh, but but these were taken up again in 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 Bandung. These principles of neutrality. Uh, which uh, a set of nations, uh, Asian and African, uh, got together, actually half of the world, pop representing half of the world population. This is an enormous thing. They got together and said, um, you know, and they made certain assertions about the type of world order they wanted to establish or the type of international order they wanted to establish and represent. That is non-alignment. This later became the famous non-aligned movement, of course. But the, the existential challenge at the time was not to be dragged into one or another of the uh, two superpower blocks that had already begun or embarked on, on a Cold War. So ASEAN is built on these principles, stands for these principles. But also historically, the way in which this region operated, both maritime, there's a maritime Southeast Asia, and there's a or archipelagic Southeast Asia, and there's a continental Southeast Asia, the way in which this region interacted with the rest of the world, between Indian Ocean, the Indian Ocean world, and the world of sort of the South China Sea and of the Pacific, the way in which it interacted between China and India and, the, and uh, West Asia, and then later European powers, was again all about a kind of what today we would call a kind of open um, regionalism. So, so, so ASEAN represents that tradition. It isn't just this set of nations that you often can forget about, except when there's war, but uh, we represent a way of doing international relations that's actually coming into into in, in, into uh, into its uh, you know, onto the global stage now in a big way, right? So that the whole world is faced with the problem of multipolarity now. Uh, but ASEAN is a very very interesting project in that and, and a historical example of that. I said two things. I'll quickly get to the second. The second is that there are ways in which Southeast Asian countries have dealt with one another and with uh, the powers around them, with the Islamic world, with India, with the, with the South Asian world, and with China, and also Japan, that, that are really interesting and, and, and important and, and something we can, we can get into. And these are uh, historical. Uh, these have to do with trade system of trade, these have to do with culture and religion, because overwhelmingly, these interactions were peaceful. So I think that would be my answer to your question. ASEAN is a fascinating thing, and I absolutely agree. The In, in, in many ways, we've had a multipolarity in Southeast Asia for, for a long, long time in the way that the region interacts with each other, and the region has been quite peaceful. I mean, the biggest, the biggest disturb, the, 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 disturbance to peace was introduced through the, the, the colonial wars in Vietnam, Absolutely. first against the French and then against the Americans, and then the, 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 the spread of that in Cambodia and Laos, which was basically just collateral damage from that, from that colonial war. And once that was over, it was pretty, pretty quiet, um, especially after then the Chinese-Vietnamese war were over, which was short. Um, and then it has been pretty stable. But the region has been criticized for a long time for not being the EU, because ASEAN is so weak, ASEAN needs to work in, uh, you know, uh, in consensus, and ASEAN is not a real actor, and la 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 la, yeah, it's not yeah, the EU, yeah, and yeah. we've talked about that, right? Um, but it now turns out that nobody wants to be the EU anymore, and the ASEAN way, all of a sudden, doesn't look that... Um, that, that um, backward anymore and it looks very forward in the sense that yeah. you manage to be together without um, being a unit right unity without exactly. without, without exactly. unifying yeah um, yeah both of you maybe now mm -hmm. you 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 studied also especially Myanmar how is it that this region is able to keep unity without becoming a unit well just before um, I answer that question I just want to add a little bit to what you described about war in Southeast Asia. And one thing I would wa want to mention is that after colonization, um, things didn't return to peace yet. There was the Cold War, which you know it globally is 
name that said to be Cold War, but in Asia, particularly Southeast Asia, it was hot war and Cambodia, um, Vietnam, those places were heavily bombed. And so Pete did not return to Southeast Asia until um, very recently. Um, so there is that. And I think that kind of also adds to the point that John mentioned, which is how um, significant uh, the non-alignment movement is for Southeast, Southeast Asian countries and how um, maintaining their own sovereignty without getting um, um, bogged into other people's wars is, is also very significant uh, in Southeast Asia. And so I think um, that also answers partly your question, which is how does ASEAN maintain kind of unity without um, being fragmented? And I think it, it, it's the shared history of colonization or colonialism is what one thing that unites Southeast Asia. Everyone, all of the countries experienced um, colonization, even though Thailand was nominally independent, it kind of had to um, self-colonize itself and, and undergo um, kind of a revolutionary reform of the entire country, the political system. It was a huge upheaval. And this is the point I would like to discuss maybe with um, the two of you later, but in that sense, it's very similar to Japan, another country that was nominally independent, but had to undergo Meiji restoration and reform itself. So I think it's it's the, um, going back to your question, I think it's the history of colonialism and then arising from it um, and now facing Asian history, if I may say, um, China is economically and geopolitically rising and with that Southeast Asia, so I think there's a kind of optimism, even though um, we are in a very turbulent moment right now, um, there is that kind of hope in Southeast Asia that that uh, things are, are getting better for them. And the maybe let me add to that that I forgot when I when I counted the the wars there there was there are two very significant wars that I forgot and one is uh, with Papua New Guinea. And the other one is with East Timor, and the but these wars too, which are like centered around the Indonesian archipelago, they came to an end, and they came to some sort of reconciliation, especially with East Timor, which is now you know just waiting. It's just a matter of, a, of months or years until until it will become the eleventh member of ASEAN. Yeah. It's kind of a yep. done deal. This mm -hmm. is open. Um, mm -hmm. What do you think? Um, do you think that this colonial legacy, uh, uh, this <laughs> the, the the or the colonial scars, are now healing, or are we already over the over the the worst, or is the is the, the legacy of colonialism still some a defining factor in the way that as the the ASEAN countries work in this region? Uh, maybe um, John or 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 Naoko. Yeah, I, I think. If I may, may jump in first, um, I think it's the final overcoming of the legacy of colonialism. Uh, remember, I think there was a very strong awareness after nominal independence that colonialism wasn't over. Hence the the the, the phrase neo-colonialism, right? It was it was a big big term and 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 a shared understanding, uh, not just in this region but across. The global south you have to remember the southeast asia is at the heart not just of you know relationships in our region but of of a set of solidarities across the global south at bandung it was half the you know 1.5 billion people at the time half the population of the world were were, were represented uh in this so there is a sense that it's colonialism is not over it became afterwards, you know, post-1991, et cetera, you have this kind of unipolar moment. It became unfashionable to even use the term neocolonialism, whatever you call it, right? This U.S. financial uh, hegemony or, or the unipolar order of the moment, that I think it, this is the final overcoming of it and the attainment of the sovereignty that they uh, people have sought. So this is the moment for it. 
And, and this is found not just in your internal reform, uh, you know, about taking charge of one's own country, but in your international relations. Because colonialism wasn't just about subjugating particular countries. It was about, if you, if you look at our maps, if you look at the types of government in the region, and if you look at what, how states are defined today, the entire order in which we are organized is a legacy of that period. This is not to say you're going to shove it, you know, throw it overboard. But, you know, it's coming to a place where, where your own agency, your own sovereignty, the civilization from which you emerge, which had its own forms of international dealing, interstate relations, these are coming back to the fore now. So I would, again, to answer your question, this is the final overcoming of it. And people can see this. Multipolar order isn't just about, you know, I am free from US hegemony, et cetera, but about recovering a certain set of relationship between states and between peoples. Now, Kozanyu, what's your observation? Yeah. Um, John just uh, said what I um, had in mind too, but um, yes, I think it's, yeah, overcoming of colonialism, the first colonialism, but then the second colonialism or neocolonialism or neo uh, or liberal neoliberalism, because the second colonialism was done through finance. Yeah. The colonial powers weren't, weren't in the region anymore because they didn't have to, because they could just colonize through finance. So that was how things were done until recently, until now, and it's still ongoing. But now we are seeing, Southeast Asians are seeing the rise of the BRICS, the rise of you know, um, China, uh, India, Russia. Uh, they are observing how the world is changing and changing so fast. So um, I think that is really making people in Southeast Asia think and step back and see which way the world is moving right now. Um, most recently, the assassination uh, attempt of Donald Trump. People in the world are all watching this and are seeing, wow, look at this. This is this is what's happening in, in the US. In, in the West. And um, so um, I think, um, yeah, and then the, there are other things like de-dollarization. So it's in that context that I think Southeast Asia is healing from post um, previous colonialism. One thing that uh, is coming up it has already been there for the last couple of years, but in, in, re in the last few years, it got more and more this narrative coming from the US and from Europe toward Africa on the one hand, but Southeast Asia on the other, saying like, oh, don't be stupid, you know, China is trying to do neocolonialism in your area. They try to debt trap you. And China is debt trapping all of these Southeast Asian nations with its, with its uh, Belt and Road Initiative. <laughs> so the funny. debt trap, don't fall for the debt trap. Uh, don't, uh, and you are being vulnerable. What do you say to this? I, I mean, it's oh obviously stupid, God. but please No, that don't. is so, so ridiculous, right? These guys from, uh, from Europe, the West, the US, trying to teach Southeast Asians about their relationship with China is the funniest thing there is. I, I, they really can't see themselves, okay? People in this region have historical memory. They have a memory of... 1,500 years at least, I mean, we're talking about cultural and historical memory of interaction with China, and of course, more recently of interaction with the People's Republic of China, and there's none of that. The, I think the one that is pushed, the narrative that is pushed, uh, the, sort of the debt trap one is absolutely dead in the water. People know about debt trap here, post-IMF, for example, what happened to Indonesia in, in, in after the 1997 crisis. It wasn't China that did this. And actually, China played a very constructive role in, uh, in refusing to devalue, in holding off devaluation of the yuan uh, during the Asian financial crisis and kind of holding the, the, the breach. But uh, China has only played a constructive role in international finance uh, in the region. Uh, but 
uh, the, the other narrative and the one that has more play is the one about you know this aggressive China's uh, aggression, maritime aggression. Yeah, that's the that's that's the other one, and that's that's the more substantial kind of uh, narrative. But there is a there's a lot of uh, there's a lot to discuss behind that. Yeah. Is it, so is you know, it, it's not it's think... not just a joke that that countries in the region that leaders you know one after another will tell you whether it's Prabowo or whether it's you know a Malaysian leader Mahathir or, or Anwar whoever it is they'll tell you hey you know we've had a couple of thousand years of, of interaction with China they have never invaded us okay so it's a very different thing you're coming into this world into the into a region by the way this is a region with almost as many people as 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 Europe. And you're just imposing your your understanding, you're projecting your assumption of how interstate relations work onto us as if we have no history. Yeah. No. Well, Prime Minister, former Prime Minister of um, Malaysia, Mahathir, would always like to say, China, for the last two thousand years, never invaded us. All right. Um. Yeah. But anyway, um, to to add to join John's point, um. Well, Southeast Asians, because of the you know media uh, and then social media, uh, they're watching what's happening in the world. And one thing I think they're watching is what's happening in Africa. So we've been seeing how African African countries like Mali, um, Burkina Faso, um, and with Niger, um, they're rising, and then they are um, gaining sovereignty. Um, and so there's they are seeing that, that. and. Um, Another thing about Southeast Asia is that there are many overseas uh, Southeast overseas Chinese population in Southeast Asia, and they have blended um, over the centuries um, with the local population. And they are also Southeast Asians. And people who come to Southeast Asia, foreigners who come to Southeast Asia, um, don't uh, always understand that. And and say, look, Chinese are so bad, but then they are speaking very often to overseas Chinese or non-Chinese, ethnically non-Chinese, but but many of them have, you know, mothers or or grandparents who are Chinese ethnically. So yeah. it's it's you know, I, I lived in Southeast Asia for many years and it's so embarrassing to see them come, see foreigners come to Southeast Asia. And then just tell local people how bad the Chinese are. And then because Southeast Asians are so polite, they will, you know, they'll stay quiet and just listen. But that doesn't mean that they are accepting what foreigners are saying to them. I can vouch for this. This is actual experience. <laughs> really? It was hilarious. You sit there and these guys come in and then they give us a lecture about, you know, Free and open Indo Pacific or something, and then the China is the great threat. Yeah, you and all don't that. have to. And everybody yeah, sits there politely, it, right? The but the Japanese. whole room is full of people of Chinese descent, or after you know, or in some way or another, you know, related to them. So it's 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 pretty absurd. Yeah, I wanted yeah, to but... catch your 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 point earlier about EU versus ASEAN. I couldn't let that go because. You know, I, I I started this 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 think think tank, and for for a while, I was quite in. Uh, well, actually, since then, I, I've been very involved over the years with 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 um, ASEAN and and ASEAN uh, issues. And for a time, I worked quite actively on promoting ASEAN integration. But throughout all that time, and even my time in 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 government, <laughs> uh, whenever I met EU people, the assumption was we were just some sort of maldeveloped, you know, immature EU. We're on our way to growing up. To having true kind of international sort of uh, institutions, right? Supranational institutions. Uh, so you guys are just some sort of malformed, you know, <laughs> halfway there thing. And of course, this kind of this 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 uh, convergence theorem doesn't doesn't work at all. And and I mean, we're just tired of apologizing for for ASEAN as not the EU. Now, at the time, it was less ludicrous than it is now. Now you can't. People just laugh you out of court if you say, oh, you know, you should be like the EU. The EU has become a negative example. Whatever lesson you draw from it, you just know you do not want to become like that, right? This, this sort of loss of sovereignty is absolutely, <laughs> absolutely off the table for, for, ASEAN, is, uh, for, for ASEAN countries. 
what ASEAN is, is a little bit harder to articulate in, in classic terms of European diplomacy and European, European international relations or Western international relations in which we're all trained. I mean, the language in which you and I speak, you know, oh, institutions, rule of law, and so on, they, they don't capture what's really going on in ASEAN. A lot of what's going on in ASEAN is better described in historical, empirical, and, and anthropological terms, how people relate to one another. So, yeah, so ASEAN doesn't have to apologize for not, no longer, you know, apologizes for not being the EU. What it is in itself and what it can do that's just emerging now. Yeah, and you know the ASEAN as a as a, a political bloc and as an as a, yes. a diplomatic tool in as a forum where these ten countries slash eleven slash plus so and so many meet is is a way to structure the region, right? And the, the fascinating thing when it I is. took part in a couple it of is. these meetings is like everybody is unhappy with the the fact that ASEAN cannot yep. you know cannot do more, but everybody agrees that they want to be together. Everybody agrees yeah. that they belong together and, yeah. you know, that that they want to have a common approach, even though they they can't find exactly the angle in order to do it. But that's also a source of strength in, in, a, in a way that it makes you want to be a community, right? And the, the Europeans yes. went, went the way of supranational integration and the whole roof is now coming crashing down on them yes. <laughs> in, a, in a very yes. bad way. So In a uh, very bad way. Yes, yes. Yeah, ASEAN exemplifies yeah, yeah uh, a, a type of re relationship. So what they stand for, this ref uh, open regionalism, this refusal, this is a categorical refusal of alliances, of military alliances in particular, right? Uh, this insistence on conversing with one another, um, that's the source of their... The, the kind of influence, whatever influence ASEAN has, the modest influence ASEAN has in world affairs that's uh, captured by the term or that they describe by the term ASEAN centrality. So ASEAN is at the center. It's the hub in a set of regional institutions, conversations, if you will, that happen an, on an annual cycle, right? That constituted the regional order before the latest sort of escalation and the return of the, you know, of the, of the Western powers. But it's it's that it exemplifies those relationships. You know, the the, the great historian uh, Wang Gangwu once told me, you know, if ASEAN didn't exist, if, if ASEAN crumbled, right, it, it fell apart, we would have to invent it all over again. It's it's its achievement is its existence, actually. So it's always going to be failing and always going to be sort of not quite there. But I wouldn't underestimate the importance of just exemplifying those relations. Yeah, so it's the structure of it that that's important. This consensual thing in which each nation is really quite adamant about its sovereignty, doesn't try not to give up uh, sovereignty, but continues to hold together. Yeah. Now, now, Kosan, like you also worked with Myanmar, right? Especially after yeah. its opening in two thousand eleven. Um, overall, like the the. ASEAN was very, very welcoming to a to the integration of Myanmar. And even right now, as Myanmar is suspended, they are still trying to, to save the spots, right? To save the space for Myanmar. So what do you think the Myanmar example also tells us about how ASEAN is structured? Yes. And um, in fact, I think that the one of the reasons Myanmar kind of um, came back to the world stage in um, 2011 was that ASEAN patiently waited for, for Myanmar. Um, it didn't uh, impose pressure on Myanmar. Um, it was just inviting Myanmar to, to be a member. Um, uh, I remember this. When it's yeah. ready. Yeah, it actually, John, Key point. I think you should, you, should, you should say it because it, it, yeah, um, John had no, we were starting to get involved, you and I, in Myanmar. Yeah, and then Myanmar 20... was the missing puzzle 10. in in ASEAN. It was yeah. the you know ASEAN, yeah. the nine nine countries, and Myanmar was the missing piece of puzzle there. And and yeah, you, yeah, already it... a member, but uh -huh. but still kind of closed. And mm -hmm. I think the ASEAN foreign ministers, the ASEAN leaders engaged Myanmar. But continue to engage Myanmar. And I think one of the impetuses for Myanmar opening up was these leaders 
taking trips to Bangkok, for example, and just or, or, or to Kuala Lumpur or Singapore and just just seeing right how things were done and and seeing that there was uh, the, the progress that had been made. Uh, they didn't want to be left behind. Myanmar does not want to be left behind. So so it was this kind of this played a, a key role and an and underappreciated role in the opening of Myanmar. Mm. Yeah, if I could just add to that, the reason I'm raising this point is because um, around that time, we were often being told, oh, it's because of U.S. pressure, you know, you had sanctions on Myanmar that they they came back, you know, that they, um, so, no, no, it's way. not, it's not the sanctions, it's no, no way. <laughs> They're, they're not afraid of sanctions. The, you know, the, the West loves to look at itself as the motor of everything that happens. Therefore, whenever something happens, it mm -hmm. must have been as a reaction mm -hmm. to what they did previously. But yeah, this is yeah. a beautiful mm -hmm. way of explaining that, no, the, these regions, they, they work by themselves. And it's, it's um, yeah, I this... mean, right now, ASEAN that, tries uh, yeah. to mentize again, right? Tries to find out ways to quell the, the, uh, the civil war that's going on inside Myanmar so far not successful, but as in is interacting with it and even had high level talks with the, uh, the junta, um, although officially that they don't recognize them, but they try to have talks, they have tried to have diplomacy. Yeah, exactly. That's a great point. Mm -hmm. You want to contrast that with uh, EU, the EU's treatment of uh, Orban and, and, and yeah. Hungary right now. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's just this cancel, and, cancel and, culture, you know, right? <laughs> you know, we, we don't do that in ASEAN. Uh, there they is a pragmatism below that. And, yeah. and it's, a, it's a pragmatism that works. The Indonesians, uh, ASEAN, invited under the, yeah. I mean, invited the junta leader. And he came and there were talks and he went back, which also meant he had the trust that to ASEAN that he wouldn't be, you know, backstabbed or something. So Absolutely. the ASEAN way works kind of works more, way more quietly than right. the right. US quietly, approach. Quietly, informally. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. And and what one must avoid is to see this just as dysfunction, or to see this through a, a, a Western lens and say, okay, it's just because these people are, you know, it's an informal culture, right? They don't understand rules very much and they're just willing, oh, they're very just very pragmatic. No, these people have been interacting with each other for centuries. That's yeah. what and underlies it. And, and the actors aren't even necessarily aware of it. Southeast Asia, as we are entering a, a so-called multipolar world, one point I wanted to make is that there's also a multipolarity of forms of international relations. Mm. You are going to see different epistemologies of international relations, a different notion of what is a state, of what is a people, of what it means to interact with, 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 with people. Right. And there is certainly that you might wonder what these nations have in common. It's the most politically diverse kind of collection of nations on earth. Everything from Leninist party state to monarchies, right? Absolute monarchy on one hand. You have this whole range. And how these people keep talking to one another, is it because they're hypocrites? They relate to one another. So it's not as if ASEAN is saying this is a lesson for everybody. Although I think the belief is that the, the core principles for coexistence and neutrality, I think those those there is a belief in, in its in its universality. But the way in which Southeast Asian countries relate to one another and also to China, that goes back a long way and is pretty embedded in in, in culture and in, in history. So again, I want to counterpose that, oppose that to just some notion that these people are just, you know, uh, you know, sub-Europeans. <laughs> mm. uh, we, we're not. <laughs> No, it's, a, yeah. it's, 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 a, it's a dumb way of thinking of the entire region. But I have a, right. another question to the anthropologist. Um, uh, why, does, why does ASEAN end in Myanmar? Why is Bangladesh not part of it? Uh, I have this, just wondered this for a while. Why this geographical, why is ASEAN where it is and doesn't go further into like the Indian subcontinent or, or even further north? Do you have any kind of idea about that? Yeah. So well Good question. Oh, you said Bangladesh, but maybe another um, example could be Sri Lanka, mm -hmm. because Sri Lanka is, you know, it's considered to be South Asia, but then culturally, religious, in terms of religion, it's it's a Theravada Buddhist, largely um, Theravada Buddhist country, and then in that sense, it has similarities with countries like Myanmar, um, 
Yeah, you know, they've expressed in interest in ASEAN so, before. Mm -hmm. They've actually expressed interest so, in joining ASEAN. Yeah. yeah, go on. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So, so why not? Yeah, that that's a good question. But maybe it has to do with history, um, the birth of ASEAN, how it came to be. Um, it was formed. First, there were five countries: uh, the Philippines, Thailand, Singapore. Malaysia and uh, one more. What was one more? Um, I'm missing one more. But Brunei. Anyway, there yeah. were five countries. Was it Brunei? No. Yeah. I I think it Brunei. Was a bit... Malaysia, Singapore, Thailand, Indonesia. Malaysia, Sing... mm -hmm. Oh, Indonesia. I think in Indonesia. 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 Yeah. Brunei later. So, yeah. 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 So because it emerged from those five countries, um, and then. I think it, it started small. And so now it's, yeah, it's 10. Um, but before that, Myanmar, uh, Vietnam, um, you know, those countries weren't included. So I think it's maybe trying to be minimalist, uh, so to speak, uh, without adding too many countries. Uh, because, yeah, 10 countries is, I think, quite enough uh, so far. And, and then another thing they did was to add informally other countries, not Bangladesh or Sri Lanka, but plus three, um, and then plus three, plus three. So so Japan and, that way and that, South Korea and... And China right. is the plus. Yeah, the it's concentric rings. Three. Yeah, you have this China, yeah. Japan, South Korea, and then, mm -hmm. yeah, then plus three, plus two, et cetera, yeah. And, and, yeah. So this is the concentric ring thing. Yeah, and ASEAN yeah. has been man has managed to build these these relationships, and actually, you can see how Ch how Japan is still is extremely interested in this, and also using this and with the TPP and with it, with its other free trade agreements that that it makes, and China is interested in in, in this and in interacting with it. So, in a sense, like the ASEAN countries, ASEAN and the individual countries, they do try to uh, promote uh, individual, especially trade agreements, trade arrangements for. for for the region. The problem we have is that there are individual disputes, especially about a couple of islands and fishing rights that, especially from the, the, the I'm sad to say, but from, from the US side is also being fueled in a sense, while at the on, on the other hand, if I was in the Philippines, I would feel bullied by China, I must say that. It's like, you know, the ASEAN countries do have, they, they, it, not everything is at peace, right? They do have tensions. But the point is that tensions uh, have historically also been managed under the threshold mm -hmm. of yep. open yep. warfare. Yep. Yep. Yeah. And I think ASEAN centrality here is a very imp important and interesting concept because, because, you know, no one is afraid of ASEAN countries. Like, is there anyone who's afraid of, I don't know, Thailand or <laughs> yeah. Asia yeah. or Indonesia? I mean, no one's afraid of them. And then, um, but countries like China and Japan cannot talk with each other directly very often because of political reasons. But then there is economic interest. They want to trade, um, have uh, you know good relationships in, in those terms. So ASEAN can be like a, a center for bringing other countries together that often cannot speak with each other directly. Thank you.